Welcome back to our conference today with presentations now from European Command and Africa Command. Again, the conference program with the full agenda and biographies of all of our speakers is available for download at the bottom of the events page, and there's a link to that in the chat. The event is being recorded and will be available after the event is done. The raised hand function will not be used today, but please enter all of your questions for our panelists into the Q&A function. All are welcome to upvote the questions of the greatest interest. Now next, I will introduce Dr. Nanahal Singh, a fellow professor in the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval War College and director of the Africa Studies Group. Dr. Singh, thank you for being our moderator for the UCOM and AFRICOM panel today. Um, welcome. My name is Nani Hal Singh from the Naval War College, and I'm so happy to be able to moderate this panel today. Thank you so much, Nani Hal. And I see your camera on. There we go. We welcome um, you and thank you. This panel includes presentations from the J4J5's team from UCOM and AFRICOM to talk about operationalizing climate security. Before we introduce our speakers, we wanted to provide some administrative guidance. I will, in, I will only introduce our panelists by their name and current titles to provide them with the maximum opportunity to present. The biographies for all our speakers are available in the conference program, available on the conference events page. Please post all questions and comments in the chat for the question and answer period after the presentations. You also have the ability to upvote questions, which will help us identify the most important questions to ask our panelists. From European Command today, we have Mr. Gary Russ, an environmental partnership specialist from the J-4, and Commander Jake Cass, U.S. Coast Guard representing the J-5. Well, good day to the team from Europe. Uh, Dr. Sin and uh, Andrea, I just want you to know that you're interrupting my beer 30 today. So uh, uh, we'll try and get done soon so I can turn my camera off and begin, uh, you know, my my after effects. Uh, I work in the UCOM J-4 and my partner, Commander uh, Jake Cass, uh, resides in the J-5. The two of us will try and paint the evolution of the current site picture of UCOM's climate change common operating picture along with where we think it is going. Next slide, please. These are a, a, a couple of long uh, statements here, but one is by General Walters, our combatant commander, and then uh, the NATO uh, sec def or charge d'affaire. Uh, basically, he, the combatant commander is talking to the Congress last year and applying com, uh, climate change to our strategic environment as one of his priorities. And of course, in the second bullet, uh, the charge d'affaire focuses on theater and the application to our partners. Next slide, please. As countries in Europe address climate change and its impacts, it's imperative that DOD be aware of the policy responses at every level including policies at the supranational, national, and municipal level. Policies may directly influence DOD activity in the near term, example, pollution user fees, and may also change conditions within European operating environments in the long term. For example, a greater electrification of logistics infrastructure. In UCOM, it's anticipated that the European uh, regulations will be more aggressive uh, than the U.S., and UCOM is going to have to demonstrate that respect. Uh, one example would be the logistics supply chain if you were have, having to go through Europe or Paris. Uh, back in uh, about six months ago, they reduced their city speed limit by 20 kilometers per hour to a maximum of 30 kilometers per hour for about 20, 19 uh, miles per hour. Uh, so it, whether you're gonna pay additional fees or you're gonna slow down your normal supply chain activities, uh, you're gonna be challenged by some of these uh, controls at the various levels. Next slide, please. So 
So Europe has been upgrading their transport a rail and road network from the east to the west over the last couple of years with completion in about approximately five years. Uh, the Three C's initiative is a coherent and integrated infrastructure in the region. This will even out the economic imbalances of the European common market and increase the role of Central and Eastern Europe in international trade along the new Silk Road corridors. The Three's initiative, Three C's initiative investment fund was established, raising between three and five billion dollars to complement the EU country to complement uh, dollars or euros spent out of the, each one of the countries. As you can appreciate, there's different uh, weight systems on the actual hard stand roads. There's different uh, grades on the rail. Uh, and so they're changing to the Western standard uh, along the Eastern side. Uh, and they're probably about a third to a half way through. Next slide, Jake. All right. So good afternoon. Good day. Good morning. Uh, global warming trends are causing sea ice melt in the Arctic. Decrease sea ice extents, decrease the Earth's albedo, and drive sea surface temperature warming. This creates a feedback loop known as Ar Arctic amplification, which further warms the Arctic. Decreased sea ice increases accessibility for human activity. This can be for resource extraction, uh, petrochemical or other uh, important uh, rare earth minerals. For commercial fishing, where the Central Arctic Ocean currently has a moratorium on fishing through 2037, uh, but that's all, uh, while it's legally binding, it's, uh, it's an agreement that could easily be undermined. And uh, in increased access uh, opens opportunity for commercial and tourist space maritime shipping. These activities create an increased need for search and rescue and pollution response coordination and capabilities. And uh, looking from the other side of the coin, these are likely the similar considerations driving Russia's investments in the Arctic, where they're uh, remilitarizing old Cold War facilities and investing in additional infrastructure there. Uh, additionally, warming is thawing permafrost, which threatens existing infrastructure, uh, buildings, tanks, pipelines, airfields. Uh, it complicates the development installation of new infrastructure and is a significant source of methane. Increased access creates an opening frontier for malign actors, Russia, PRC, to erode the foundation of the rules-based order, which in the Arctic is primarily founded on the United Nations Conventional Law of the Sea, uh, which accounts for the divisions of the ocean, including the extended continental shelf and freedom of navigation. And that's the basis of our global power projection and is fundamental to our globally integrated free market economy. Uh, the Arctic Council is the preeminent governing body for the Arctic, and it's currently observing a strategic pause due to the Ukrainian crisis. And time will tell how other Arctic collaboration for are affected uh, as we progress. The Arctic is in danger of geostrategic spillover uh, from other conflict and competition in the, air, in the region. Uh, but uh, rooted in the Arctic strategy and the Yukon's regional annex, the goals for Yukon are to preserve the st st stability of the Arctic, uh, a region where countries work cooperatively the rules-based order is reinforced and the homeland is defended. Next slide, please. This is a, uh, a graphic we stole from the EU. It depicts aggregate potential impact for climate change, which uh, is essentially a combination of potential physical, environmental, social, economic, and cultural impacts. This is a comparison of historical data and modeled data for the latter half of the uh, 20 hundreds, 2070 to 2100. As you can see, areas of uh, stress uh, in the south for heat and water, permafrost issues in the high north, and areas of concern are concentrated along the coastline. Uh, unfortunately, there's no data for the Balkan Peninsula. This is the area where likely has the most strained governance in the Yukon AOR. And as our evolution of thoughts unfolded, all things being equal and Assuming we had resources to initiate events in support of climate change, this is where we would have started. Next slide, please. 
This is a snapshot of some of the humanitarian assistance disaster response events that occurred within the last year. Again, stepping back to our initial thoughts, we figured using a proactive approach uh, to reduce reactive response requirements, i.e. security cooperation versus HADR, uh, would provide a solid basis to operationalize climate change. Next slide, please. Over to Gary. So as everyone recognizes, the international security implications are the point. The implications of heat in the north and the south differ are to areas collapsing infrastructure or northern Mediterranean Sea countries' lack of water for crops. This crosses borders and creates different international focus from the same issue. Either way, the potential for a country destabilizing is critical. As such, we developed a few questions that plague us that may be of value for the conference to consider. Uh, I don't, Jake and I really don't have the answers to these. We've certainly thought about them uh, and would love to have some further, you know, discussion. I, I don't know that I, I told Andrea that I was going to do this, but these, these have been uh, uh, pestering us, you know, for the last year. Next slide, please. So it, these are UCOM's equities, but not in any other any particular sequence uh, other than the top two. Uh, <clears throat> there are numerous options for UCOM to partner with, and each has their own political agenda for all these allies and partners inside of Europe. And and they they have a twofold focus because you know they also do a lot of combined effort with the Africom AOR. Uh, also, they're all trying to be create a proactive versus a reactive response. And, and that's, you know, I think a critical point as you do the education and, and try to set conditions so they can respond appropriately. The European, the only thing I would talk about on the other ones would be the migrants. And that's, Europeans are very, uh, it's a politically sensitive issue. Uh, the example is, as already talked about, you know, the, on 21 May, there was about six to 8,000 migrants that crossed over from Morocco into uh, one of the Italian island or the Spain's island. Uh, and then uh, 1.3 million migrants crossed from Syria in 2015. Uh, and of course, notwithstanding today's movement of the Ukraines, which is upwards of a one, I want to say it's uh it's a over. It's more than a million. I, I don't know its exact number at the moment. Next slide, please. Jake. All right. So uh, our, our climate change efforts thus far, uh, I'd like to characterize that what we've uh, been doing recently. It's really grassroots uh, and and starting to target with the uh, lowest hanging fruit. Uh, we're also working to develop some pilot programs to learn lessons and then integrate more broadly uh, as we uh, use it to uh, integrate climate, cha climate change considerations more broadly across the staff. So first, uh, educating the staff. Uh, Gary and I have embarked on a campaign of office calls uh, all around the, uh, the campus and also participated in a variety of conferences to help prime the pump and educate the staff about uh, the task of including climate change into across the enterprise. I would say though that our real money thus far has primarily been made AO to AO. And this has mainly come recently uh, following the establishment of our climate change working group, uh, which uh, was finally um, penned in the last week but we've met twice. Uh, it's a monthly group with representatives from all directorates, as well as installation managers for all the components and components. Uh, we're still working to ensure we get uh, representation from all of those entities. Uh, that said, the discussions so far have been very fruitful and, and provided uh, great AO level uh, areas to prime the pump as, as I suggested. Uh, strategic documents, that's, that's kind of the easy part, really. Uh, Gary and I and members of our team chop on anything we can get our hands on and ensure climate change is incorporated. Uh, this will be a lot easier 
uh, when uh, the NSS, NDS, and MS and MS is released, so that uh, as all the other nesting that occurs across our enterprise, uh, everyone will be looking at uh, climate change that's been chopped on uh, across uh, all components and, and the joint staff. Exercises, I'd say we have uh, a nascent uh, effort, but it's, it's progressing uh, quite well. Uh, again, from our, our working group, uh, the climate change that will be incorporated into the planner tools, uh, which will then uh, be considered in the development of the UCOM level exercises, which highlights uh, kind of a span of control uh, challenge. Uh, components control most of the exercises, even if they are considered joint. And so we need to make sure we incorporate and uh, coordinate with the components as, as we develop this effort. We're also looking to develop mission essential tasks, which will bake in climate change to future exercise activities moving forward. Plans, uh, we're starting with an Arctic plan and we're baking climate change into that. We'll take the lessons learned and inject those into the next tranche of plans that's developed as the spring moves forward. Security cooperation, uh, we're competing a bit with bandwidth uh, with the Ukraine crisis, but we've got several prime areas for collaboration that have been identified through the CFR system and in discussion with our, our colleagues in security cooperation and partnerships. Um, Arctic Security Forces Roundtable, which is a uh, the only uh, Arctic Center, Arctic related fora that discusses hard security, which is explicitly uh, left off the Arctic Council Charter. Uh, we will feature climate change uh, during the event that will be held and hosted by NORTHCOM uh, in May. For NATO, um, it, I'd say we've got lots of progress to do here, uh, lots of undone work, uh, but one line of thought is leveraging the uh, COEs, Centers of Excellence, uh, and the variety of uh, efforts that they've got ongoing to integrate there and also uh, leverage what's happening already. Wargaming as a COSTI, I'm just going to stay away from that one. And assessments, uh, we'll uh, keep that similar to the uh, strategic documents because that'll get chopped across the command, uh, the, the national and, and COCOM-wide assessments and, and ensure that uh, climate change is incorporated into those. Next slide, please. All right, moving forward. Uh, current under, uh, underway efforts, efforts capitalize on the uh, current funding environment, i.e. Uh, let's make sure we're taking credit for what's happening uh, and uh, be prepared to answer the mail as queries happen in the future. Uh, we'll be prepared for funding next fisc fiscal year as we expect DEEK or uh, anticipate DEEK will be funded uh, and we'll assist in posture to ensure assessments are completed uh, for DCAT. We'll continue to build our network, identifying several fruitful engagement points, having previously identified several dead ends. And the better our network, the better our ability will be to respond to upcoming climate change deadlines and data calls. And that concludes my comments. Um, thank you very much to Mr. Gary Russ from the J4 and Commander Jake Cass for their presentation on UCOM. Next, we will hear from the AFRICOM team. Mr. Garth Anderson is the Chief of Environmental Security in the J4, and Ms. Swathi Viravali is representing the J5. We look forward to hearing your presentation today. All right, thank you. And I'm uh, Garth Anderson with AFRICOM J4. Um, with regarding security implications of climate change in AFRICOM, we always take the approach of looking through the lens of our campaign plan. So if you'd give me the first slide, please. The AFRICOM campaign plan really provides the basis of, of everything we do. Um, and I'll run through the four objectives of it very quickly, just kind of set the the, the stage of, of how we, we uh, went through the process of determining uh, climate security risks. Uh, the first one is access and influence. 
Uh, we look primarily at countering the, the influence of both Russia and China as global uh, competitors. Uh, the, the second objective is countering uh, violent extremist organizations or VEOs. Here we're looking to reduce the threats and the disruption of organizations such as Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. Uh, they, they're disruptive by undermining good governance and stability on the continent, and we seek to, to counter that. <clears throat> The third objective is crisis response, and this is primarily the, the traditional role of, of responding to both natural and man-made disasters. And finally, objective number four is uh, working through our partners uh, to, uh, to build up, our allies and partners to build up their capabilities rather than have to use just, uh, just U.S. capabilities. So. We take a different approach, especially as we compete with China and Russia. We try to build partnerships rather than take a transactional approach uh, with our allies and partners. By building this capacity, they're able to respond to their own crises, and it minimizes the resources that the United States has to put against something like that. We, we tend, tend to use the term to the left of the boom. Uh, investments that we make now in their capabilities uh, have a great payoff uh, later on. And of course, our end state, you can read that. Uh, essentially, we've, we've identified and countered uh, our adversaries. VEOs are no longer disruptive and posing a threat. And above all, we maintain access and influence on the continent. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, AFRICOM recently held a uh, a symposium called the AFRICOM Security Implications of Climate Change. Uh, thought it was a, a very successful uh, endeavor that we just did it at the end of January, where we brought together players from AFRICOM, uh, from, from across the interagency, from DOD and, and our components to just look, to go through in a more of a methodical process to evaluate the impact of climate change on AFRICOM um, strategy and operations. The first task that, that I'm going to talk about, the, one of the deliverables from the symposium was to identify the climate related security threats. The first one is uh, how geopolitical competitors use climate change as an opportunity to increase their influence. China and Russia exploit climate change impacts to expand their footprints across the continent. Uh, for example, China has already launched initiatives with the African Union to promote Sino-African cooperation through joint research on climate and environmental change. Another threat, uh, overstretched U.S. and African partner nation military uh, capacities and capabilities. In other words, climate change will drive climate by increasing resource competition, uh, the potential for disease outbreaks and the frequency of natural disasters. These factors will compound African problems with overpopulation and weak governance to further stretch both partner nation and U.S. military response capacity. The third threat is the expanded influence of VEOs and other malign actors. Uh, VEOs take advantage of worsening conditions caused by environmental stressors, such as drought, by offering alternative economic opportunities and providing social services in order to build public legitimacy and to <clears throat> marginalize the, the, the actual established government. <clears throat> Most importantly, VEOs such as Al-Shabaab use governance failures uh, to respond to climate change, not only as recruitment incentives within the marginalized populations, but also opportunities to increase uh, illicit activities such as uh, armed trafficking, wildlife trafficking, and others. <clears throat> A fourth one, uh, climate change can affect the execution of our war plans through decre decreased accessibility of, to ports and airfields. Rising sea levels and, and water availability could adversely affect the operational capabilities of ports, airfields, and other forward posture locations. 
uh, the, the ability to execute war plans as well as other contingency operations would be, could be significantly affected by limited access to this key terrain. And finally, this was a, a new one that, was, that, that came to light that we hadn't thought of in our initial analysis was <clears throat> with a global trend toward electrifying transportation and developing power storage technologies is going to sharply increase the demand for batteries and the critical component minerals. A competition for these materials on the African continent uh, could potentially create internal conflict and exploitation opportunities for VEOs and global competitors. So I'll now turn it over to, to Swathi uh, to, to discuss the next component of, uh, of our analysis. Thank you, Garth. And thank you all for your time here today. I'd like to br briefly review how the security implications of climate change affect US AFRICOM's mission. First, we recognize that climate security will require a whole of government approach with USAID and state in the lead. We've historically had challenges with institutional silos within the US government, but we strongly believe that climate security offers, uh, offers us an opportunity to both integrate and elevate uh, climate change um, and address these institutional silos with a net impact to other U.S. government planning paradigms. Second, the security implications of climate change are such that the Department of Defense, the Geographic Combat Commands, um, such as all of us here today, and, the, uh, and our components will have a role. We can both help elevate and integrate climate security into our strategy, plans, and engagements. U.S. AFRICOM recognizes that there's a tolerance of risk that we are starting to outpace within the African continent that will fundamentally change the way that we, um, that, that will change the way that U.S. AFRICOM components and partner allies will function in our AOR. U.S. AFRICOM also recognizes that there are um, subnational effects and impacts that, that along with the complex interplay of local dynamics and, and governance will require subnational frames of understanding. <clears throat> that being said, in order to address the security implications of climate change, U.S. AFRICOM must first understand climate change and its implications, then plan to address those implications, and finally execute the plan to address the security implications of climate change. In light of guidance and directives from the National Command Authority and the DOD, the observed and expected in, in, implications of climate change in Africa and the threat to, US, to vital U.S. national security interests, U.S. AFRICOM sets forth the following strategic goals to address this complex, evolving, and enduring challenge. First, we seek to lead. U.S. AFRICOM leverages its planning ability and convening authority to organize and lead a whole of government with partners and allies effort to address the security implications of climate change. Shape. U.S. AFRICOM identifies and addresses the most climate uh, critical security related institutional, sorry, critical security related climate change challenges and incorporating climate change into our theater, theater strategy, campaign planning and orders. Finally, respond. U.S. AFRICOM working closely with interagency partners and allies and, and African partners is prepared to respond to U.S. climate related crises. <clears throat> That being said, there are tasks that are firmly within our lane and outside our lane. Outside our lane, we will seek to leverage our OSDP, our joint staff, USAID, state, and other partners, um, both within the African continent um, and, and th throughout globally. Tasks within our lane. These tasks will require two main subtasks. The first task is to institutional climate security. A couple of presenters have already talked about um, how their specific geographic commands have done that. AFRICOM seeks to do this by establishing the expertise and staffing capacity at U.S. AFRICOM to integrate climate security, planning, modeling, programming, and assessment across the staff. And we've done this by creating a climate security working group that coordinates act action officers across the command to provide input into the command strategy plans and engagements. We're also increasing the command's uh, climate uh, literacy to satiate learning demands within uh, by having a, um, a series of symposium and other events that um, my colleague, Mr. Anderson, just referred to. Second task, and, and perhaps this is the most important one and, and primarily why I'm here to listen to you all, um, is how to operational, operationalize climate security. Now, when I was preparing my presentation, I was looking for a doctrinal definition of, of what, what it means to operationalize. Um, and what we can while no doctrinal definition exists, Joint Pub 3-0 defines strategy as a prudent set of ideas for employing the instruments of national power in a synchronized and integrated fashion to achieve 
theater, national, or multinational objectives. And defining the operational level of warfare as the level of warfare at which campaigns and major operations are planned, conducted, and sustained to achieve strategic objectives within the theaters um, or other operational areas. So this then tells us that operationalization is a translation of strategy into campaign and or operations and plans to conduct and sustain operations to achieve strategic objectives. Planning should involve linking the capabilities and resources necessary to accomplish objectives and formulating the proper approach for further employment at the tactical level. I'd like to give a shout out to my colleague, Lieutenant Colonel um, Brow, who helped, um, who helped uh, provide that definition. What you see in the slide in front of you is our attempt to do, to, to do both those things. First, to institutionalize and second, to operationalize. With my remaining time, I will hopefully briefly go over those key challenges. First, foundational challenges. These are challenges that are internal to the command. Within AFRICOM, the overlap between the, both the biophysical drivers of change coupled with the socioeconomic drivers of change will affect U.S. AFRICOM's mission, which speaks to the criticality of creating a common operating picture. And our internal question is, how do we develop this with rig rigor to both climate and conflict modeling or downscaling that allows us to leverage the investments that our interagency partners have already made? How can we create a common operational picture for climate risk across our C4I allies and partners, as well as the, the rest of the world? How do we integrate predictive climate uh, tools into planning architectures, our integrated priority lists, posture and strategic programming? Second, theater shaping. Theater shaping is what's happening in Africa now and into the strategic horizon. Our question, main question here is what are those operations activities or investments, what OAIs, that are climate specific? And, and finally, what is, the, what, are, what is the key terrain that the OAIs will need to occur upon? Keystone challenges. These challenges are the ones that are the most difficult to answer or um, should be answered and, and could be game changers. Some of the driving underarching questions here are, where will the demands of humanitarian assistance disaster response create game-changing conditions for national security in Africa that affects U.S. AFRICOM's mission set? We acknowledge that there are several sequencing issues. How do we, how do we trade off moving troops to support European allies versus incorporating weather and climate impacts into the near, midterm, and far future for AFRICOM, um, similar to the, the problem set that our colleague Commander Cass alluded to in his presentation? How do we prioritize identifying risks on the continent as it affects our ability to conduct strategies, plans, and engagements? We need to incorporate risk into our intelligence assessments and other AFRICOM assessments. Finally, the character of warfare is inherently changing because of technology, which increases our ability to both be more agile, but how does the Department of, um, of, Depart Department of Defense Enterprise leverage these technological advancements to become more operational to climate security? Um, I'll pause there to yield more time for discussion and thank you all for your time. Thank you very much uh, to Mr. Garth Anderson and Ms. Swati Viravali for your presentation on Africa. Now I ask our presenters to please go camera on for the question and answer period. For our first question, um, how is it that the Arctic ice melt and permafrost uh, thaw is going to stress and affect Russian defense budgets and Russian defense behavior in each of these AORs. So for UCOM, the connection is obvious. Um, how is it going to impact Russian behavior across the Arctic and across Europe? But also for AFRICOM, how is it likely to impact what you see as Russian behavior across the African continent? Okay, I think uh, I can start on that one. Um, so permafrost uh, thawing it will create significant investment challenges uh, across the northern sea route, where there's a uh, already sizable footprint of uh, military bases and other uh, dual use infrastructure. Uh, I've read a few articles, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, uh, but said that the profits from resource extraction would be several orders of magnitude less 
than the investment necessary to maintain all the facilities, particularly the petroleum tanks that are highly susceptible to heave and sink uh, issues as permafrost thaw uh, occurs. AFRICOM, do you have a sense of how you expect Russian behavior to change in your AOR as a result of some of the climate change challenges? No. Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at that. Um, I mean, immediately, and uh, recognizing that we're on an open forum and an unclassified level, um, not not immediately, but indirectly, um, we also recognize that US, Russia and Ukraine are both net exporters of wheat. Um, and so I, we, we anticipate that there will be a huge food security um, impact in the future. Um, I don't know, I don't think we've done any modeling yet to, to, to estimate what that impact is, but Africa is a net importer of both Ukrainian and Russian um, wheat in export. So uh, absolutely, Garth. And, and, and it's obvious that uh, a lot of Russian uh, proxies and contractors that are that are uh, engaged in operations on the continent will probably um, have their priorities changed. So it, it may actually work in our favor in, in some cases in that we're not uh, um, having to deal with the, the Russian meddling and, and, and their, their approach to uh, gaining access and influence. So there could be two sides to that coin. Um. For your second question, who across your command staffs does the commander empower to operationalize and integrate climate security threats uh, uh, issues across the J1, J2, J3, J4, J6, J7, J8, and all of the embedded interagency and international partners? Is this for Africa? Uh, sorry, this is for, for both. Okay. Uh, both uh, okay. Well, We'll just go first and hand it over to you, Com. Um, so I think we are very lucky here at AFRICOM because we have our, our Deputy J5 Brigadier General Hobotter um, is a is a what we like to call him our climate czar. And so at the at the flag officer, general officer level, it really helps us to have that um, that his personality to help operationalize um, operationalize the climate security across the command. And under his steerage and direction, um, as I mentioned before, I alluded to the climate security working group and the climate security working group is um, it, it's combined of all our jaders. Um, action officers at the GS-13 and, and, and Lieutenant Colonel and, and below type. Um, so, so really the people who are, who are going to do the inter and the interagency community, excuse me, thank you. We also have USAID participating um, to help operationalize the, uh, the, the impacts across the command. Um, and and this, the climate security working group, um, obviously a huge cadre of, of expertise, um, also help uh, us unpack what those, those implications of climate change um, on the continent will be. And I would like to add that um, generally the default organization, whenever it comes to uh, climate, seems to land with the engineers. It always starts there. But we were successful in uh, identifying the engineers with, a, with an important but supporting role. And because of the you know, identification of threats and the integration into uh, plans and strategy, the rightful uh, leaders of the program must reside in the, in the J-5. Over. All right, I'll, I'll follow there. Uh, and I would say, obviously, uh, Swati, Garth, Gary, and I compare a lot of notes being both here in Germany. So in short, uh, it's a ECJ5 lead uh, with uh, strong support from uh, J44 uh, with Gary and his team over there. Uh, and also uh, another plug for our, our climate change working group uh, where we're using that to, uh, to really get to the right people to uh, pull these threads and mature this process. Have you included climate change considerations into your, into your supply chain guidance to your co-comps? That'd be me. I guess I could kick that off since uh, you know, I'm in, in the J4. Uh, there, there are some considerations. I don't think it's as mature as uh, 
as it is it with uh, you know strategy and plans, but logistics are catching up because some some supply chain issues are going to become critical. Uh, well, not just supply chain, but also uh, access and transportation as uh, as the effects of climate change are felt. I, I touched briefly on on uh, access to ports and airfields. Well, that that function actually resides in RJ4, so they're very concerned about about those impacts and if, if current posture locations can support the mission, you know, today, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And I'll grab it for the uh, Yukon side. Uh, so we've, we're certainly in the J4 looking at it. Uh, we're integrating it into our analysis, you know, from the, uh, as, uh, you know, reaching from the Mediterranean up to the, the Northeast and, and across. Um, we haven't actually given our uh, service components any specific guidance yet. Uh, we just haven't gained that large of a, uh, uh, engagement yet. We're still trying to, you know, get our team together and get them all working on the same working group and, and accomplish a couple of tasks. Uh, but it's certainly... You know, as I, I we briefed in our slides, uh, the EU has put billions of dollars into you know upgrading the infrastructure, which facilitates that supply chain resiliency. You know, with bridging and rail gauges and that kind of stuff. Uh, hopefully, that answers it. Over. What additional input and support from the intelligence community on climate change related matters? would be helpful to your planning with regard to your plans and strategies to prepare for and respond to future impacts of climate change. Well, not bring a picture. Um, and this is actually related to a, another question, which was about resourcing. Um, where is it that you, if you were able to ask for more, um, where is it that you feel you could effectively use more resources um, in your efforts to look forward to the potential strategic impacts of, of climate change on, on your AOR. Uh, I can I can kick that off Africom. Um, so I think I alluded to this in our in our slide deck in with the articulation of the need for a common operating picture. Um, and and what we really need is authoritative scientific data um, that includes both social science and, and physical science inputs. And, and how the Intel community, we need to be able to leverage Intel estimates, both at the classified and at the unclassified level. We're right now working primarily on the unclassified level, but obviously as things uh, move in the future, um, would like to move that over um, in onto the classified realm. So, I mean, if, if there's, I, I believe we, we're currently using C2IE, um, so if we can, you know, somehow figure out how to plug in scientific authoritative data into something like that, I think that would be a key um, key area. In terms of resources, I think what right now, we, we just need more human capital um, and dedicated resources to be able to do this from a sustained level. So right now, this is an additional duty as assigned, um, and we don't have sort of a one person being able to, to, to do this. So I think that's a, that's an issue. And, and Mr. Yeah, and and as I covered earlier, that uh, one of our campaign objectives is to work with allies and partners and build their, their capabilities up. Um, right now, any engagements that we do, to, even in the realm of environment or, or climate, is, is done through our own internal security cooperation program, which means it, it comes out of hide, which, which is fine. But given the, the rising uh, importance of, of, the, of considering the effects of climate change, I think new, new sources of funding need to be made available in order for us to uh, expand our engagements. And I know we, there is hope on the horizon as the Defense Environmental International Cooperation Fund or program may be, have their funds restored in FY23. And I know Gary probably has, he's, he's jumping up and down on that one too. So, <laughs> right, over. So, uh I guess the simple answer is just to say ditto from what my AFRICOM uh, buddies said. You know, basically, manpower is obviously a critical function. It's an adi climate change is an additional duty for both Jake and I. Uh, and, you know, obviously, the rest of the working group, uh, it's definitely their additional duty. And we're, that's why we're having to 
you know, try and jam it down their throats and make them participate with cognitive engagement, you know, thinking from their perspective. Um, as, as my, uh, my buddy Garth is, is said, you know, I'm going to hit the DA fund and, and security cooperation, security cooperation, you know, at, at the combatant command level, I, I don't, we're not counting carbon emissions, you know, maybe somebody at joint staff or, you know, SD is going to make us count them, but we're just going to ask somebody else to give us those numbers. The only way we can impact our theater is through security cooperation and, and, you know, strengthening our, you know, the weakest links, as you will, inside of our, our uh, country. For us, you know, we would probably say it's along the Balkans side of the house uh, as they continue to grow out of the former Yugoslavia countries or former country of Yugoslavia and, you know, build their own, uh, confidence and capability. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Thank you. Unless Jake's got something. There were a few different questions on the kinds of models that you've been using. Um, I'm going to pick one of them, but feel free to answer sort of more broadly. So you come talked about the DOD climate assessment tool. Um, and so this was a question for you, Com, but sort of I'm going to throw it out to, to both COCOMs. Have you been using the DCAT to assess your installation climate exposure? Are you providing information to OSD for further enhancement of the tools? And more generally, sort of what are the models and, and technical resources that you're using here? Um, as you try to deal with these challenges? So I, I'll go ahead and jump on that one. Uh, so we did an education program throughout uh, the theater regarding the DCAT so that all the components and uh, uh, installation managers understood what DCAT was. Uh, from there, uh, we're waiting for the DCAT team to come to UCOM and, and they have not provided an actual schedule for when they're going to do the assessments. Uh, the other thing uh, that all of the uh, combatant commands that, well, maybe uh, some of them anyway, have various uh, countries identified that they'll share, uh, the Department of State will share the DCAT program with, uh, I think for us, it's Germany, Italy, England, and uh I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but either way, so we'll see if that helps. Uh, other other uh, systems, we haven't really, you know, we're using the online stuff and assessing, you know, government instability and, you know, other stuff like that coming out of North, uh, or Notre Dame and, and other organizations that are uh, putting it online. Uh, Jake, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I'll just kind of go out on a limb here with a, a bit of my personal editorial. It, I do think, as AFRICOM mentioned, um, getting it into a centralized, usable tool, uh, some sort of data environment would be helpful. Uh, however, there are so many tools out there, like Gary mentioned, there's one for Notre Dame, one for University of Hawaii. There's all sorts of modeling out there. And I have a little bit of a modeling background uh, enough to know that you know different assumptions will give you different answers so all models are wrong uh, i think if we just accept that uh, and go with what we got uh, that would be beneficial uh, in incorporating it into a, a, a system that could be used accepting that it's imperfect data Yeah, from the AFRICOM side, uh, we, we use DCAT in a very limited fashion because it, it really only applies to installations and we only have one uh, location that could be described as an installation and that's in Djibouti. The rest of our, our, uh, our posture locations are, are expeditionary or just locations, logistical nodes where we can, we can surge into and you only have periodic presence. So our, I think our, <clears throat> our analysis of of climate impacts on those locations are going to be a little, to be a little more quantitative and, you know, assessing local conditions more so than, than kind of the broad brush methodology that, that DCAT did. And also use it to, to uh, use some kind of methodology like that to um, project where we want to be in the future, where, where we can best impact uh, our, our own response and our own access and influence. And I understand that there they're doing some um, upgrades to DCAT to be able to do that in, in, more, in a more expeditionary environment. So I, a yeah. 
Go I'm ahead. not answering your question. Um, I'm going to answer answer your question with another question. So we're not currently using any models yet, um, but obviously there's a huge desire, there's a huge need to leverage those social models or scientific um, and those those physical um, physical models as well and scientific authoritative data. Um, and I think the problem that we're dealing with here is that it, it's really a complex planning paradigm problem because of the mishmash of time scales. We're planning for the near, um, very near future, but unfortunately we don't have the models to to to, to sort of force. And we, we don't have, a, like Jake mentioned, of, of all models are wrong, we have um, some more wrong models at the nearer term future. So the, the scale, and, and which is complicated by the fact that the scale of data availability at the subnational scale, especially in Africa, where we don't have the longitudinal data that we need to drive some of those models. Um, so we really need to leverage scenario planning, horizon scanning, <clears throat> and other creative ways. So, I mean, this is really a call to, to the folks on, on the line, on the net, um, from our scientific community to help us with that. Over. Um, relatedly, there are a number of questions which are about your partnerships within the U.S. government. And one of them is asking, are your COCOMs working with ODNI's Climate Security Advisory Council? Because they're apparently looking at some of these issues and how to leverage modeling that's coming out of Department of Energy um, to support things. But if you could speak broadly about your, um, your engagement within the interagency, where you have some productive partnerships and you know, you had a question earlier on the intelligence community where you might be looking for a, a little bit more engagement. Yeah, I can I can go ahead and, and start um, and then leave the, the harder part to our UCOM colleagues. Um, so so in terms from a partnerships perspective, I mean, AFRICOM, I think really the whole model of AFRICOM and how it originated was from a leveraging the partnerships both within Africa and within the US government. So, so you know, resting upon those laurels. Um, we, we haven't worked specifically with the ODNI, um, but as we establish this community of interest within the command, um, then we, we establish those feedback loops within the national capital region. So we, hopefully in the future, we can anticipate working with those communities. But, you know, def definitely looking at our colleagues in OSDP and joint staff um, to, to drive some of those, uh, provide some of those policy demands that, um, that can help buttress some of our, our operational needs. Over. Yeah, from the UCOM side, we've been challenged with trying to figure out who's the belly button. Uh, and, you know, I touched uh, some guys from uh, Germany, I don't know, a couple weeks back, and it was very clear they were policy guys more worried about carbon emissions and, and that in the political side of the house, where, as I told you, you know, we're trying to be the operational side with security cooperation. So uh, we're still refining who you know, who we should utilize and, and target, you know, um, it's just hard to find, you know, a specific belly button. Jake? Yeah, it, I think I'll couple this with uh, another question I see in the chat about uh, USAID and state. Um, it's worth noting that, that we, both of those uh, agencies are represented in the J9 at UConn, and, and we speak with them often on these topics. Uh, USAID has uh, a footprint and is doing activities in the Balkans, uh, which also kind of led us to believe that's where we should start our efforts. Uh, and we recently briefed Ambassador Sterling, the uh, political advisor uh, at UConn, uh, to identify ways that we might be able to leverage state and their diplomatic efforts. Uh, one that was suggested, but we haven't fully explored quite yet, is uh, influencing uh, the country plans uh, that the embassies have, because that might help um, influence how the, uh, the folks, the military folks at post uh, execute their missions. Over. Uh, we have a recent question that's sort of a response to something that Swathi said, which is about time frame. Um, what is the time frame you're looking to prepare, you're looking for to prepare the effect uh, to to prepare for the effects of a changing climate. So, are you looking at twenty months, twenty weeks, twenty years? You know where where is it that your time horizon is, and how does that intersect with some of the other time horizons that you are hearing about and and dealing with? 
Yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, so we really have to do, I'm not a planner. Um, so I'm, and unfortunately the planners are not here in the room with us, but um, if they were here, I imagine them saying something along the lines of anything from, from right now, so very current to 2050, right? So, which is, which is a big, big, big gap. But I mean, the planners write their plans within the, you know, within five year three to five year timeframes. And so that's when we were getting at the complexity of, you know, the longitudinal climate data, not necessarily matching that um, three to two year, three to five year timeframes and the climate variability models not being as robust as we wanted them to. I mean, some are good, but we just don't have access to those. Um, so does that answer your question, Dr. Singh? Yeah, and from the uh, Yukon side, uh, exactly what she said, three to five years is, you know, you're operationalizing, trying to, you know, affect your security cooperation and, and you know, line up money and define weaknesses and, and targets. Obviously, longer term, you know, we might go as far as 10 years, you know, when we start doing some of the uh, distinct campaign plans and what have you, but uh, we're really trying to go short term. Uh, again, remember, we're not counting carbon emissions, so... Uh, obviously carbon emissions is, you know, a, a 20 to 50 year plan and, and we're, uh, you know, that, that just, we're just not impacting that specific area uh, of requirement over. Jake. All right. Um, why don't we end here instead of trying to switch, uh, sneak one more question in before uh, 1048. So, I would like to thank our presenters again from UCOM and AFRICOM today for your presentations and questions. At this point, we will return to Commander Andrea Cameron. Hello. Thank you so much to Mr. Gary Russ from the J4 and Commander Jake Cass from the UCOM presentation. And we'd also like to thank Garth Anderson and Swati Virvali from AFRICOM. It has been a wonderful presentation. You can see already from CENTCOM, AFRICOM, and UCOM how their different AORs look at the climate security risks and what they're doing about them very differently and reflective of the countries within their AORs. This was a wonderful panel showing both the respective vulnerabilities and their relationships between the two geographic combatant commands. At this point, we'll take another 10 minute break and we will return at 11 o'clock for our next panel with teams from SOUTHCOM and NORTHCOM. See you in 10 minutes.